It's my pleasure this morning to uh, welcome Dr. Ta Todd Malin. Uh, Dr. Malin received his bachelor's degree from Brigham Young University. He is board certified in obstetrics and gynecology and is an associate of the American Academy of Cosmetic Surgeons. Dr. Malin was the first U.S. physician to utilize adipose or fat-derived stem cells for soft tissue reconstruction. And with that, I will welcome Dr. Malin. Can I grab a mic from? I don't. I have a hard time standing in one place. So. There you go. Hope so. It's on. Good morning, everybody. I uh, I had to drive a whole twenty minutes to get here, so I. <laughs> <laughs> but um, welcome to our lovely state. This is a great time of year to be here. It's about the only time of year that it's great to be here. But thank you for coming, um, and thank you for inviting me to to speak. First and foremost, let me put out there that I am not an expert in periodic paralysis. My expertise is on stem cells. And many of the times when we're approaching a new situation where we're trying to utilize stem cells, a lot of that has to come from the patients themselves, meaning being able to sit down with patients to understand their disease process, to speak to their doctors who are the experts so that we can truly understand what is going on with this disease to try to determine, hey, is this a possibility for being able to utilize stem cells in this particular circumstance? And that comes down to a, a, t a type of new approach in medicine called translational medicine or translational research. And I'll try to describe a little bit about translational research and why we're finding that so useful, especially with emerging technologies and new advances like stem cell therapies. So let me just give you the summary that this is all you really need to learn today is that stem cells make bigger things like uh, snowflakes make snowmen, okay? Um, this is a video that one of our patients produced for us. Uh, and this was the first patient that we treated with the new high dose therapy, utilizing high dose stem cells along with the stem cell pace, which we'll talk about. Uh, but um, in the patients that we've treated with periodic paralysis, it hasn't been all, it hasn't been all miracles. I mean, we've had some miracles and we've had some patients, especially the ones that are the most advanced, we tend to see the greatest response. And the patients that don't have a tremendous lot of uh, degree of advancement in their disease process or early in some of the clinical stages, um, we see improvement in other areas, meaning that the patients will say, hey, my fatigability has decreased, my uh, baseline inflammation may be decreased, but um, sometimes we actually get home runs, and this is one of those cases. And this, this uh, gentleman is now, uh, and I'm, uh, he's, I'm allowed to use this video, of course, but I'm not sure that I'm allowed to use his name, so some of you probably already know him. Is it, it's not working, is it? There we go. Do you have sound now? What I would do is I would, it would take every bit of energy that I had left just to go from one end of this apartment to the other. And so, and I would be here and I would basically just collapse. But now, um, what I used to have to do was I would have to do one of these numbers and I would just really be all I could do and I would have to do this and that and finally move around 
and use it like this. I don't have to do this anymore. So what I do now, sometimes I actually have to be careful not to overlaunch myself up with the 1K. So and that's essentially what I what I'm able to do just in the seven weeks since I've had the therapy. And I can show you also now the way I, I get into bed. Used to, I had a really hard time getting into bed. So, um, I used to uh, have to get into bed, I would have to pull up my, my leg. Um, what I do now is I raise the leg and can get in there without having to drag myself. Used to, I would actually have to lift I would do one of these numbers and drag my leg over into the bed and then roll over into it like that. So that's what that's what I used to have to do. Now show us again. So his wife whispering in the background. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So uh, let me go through some, there's some terms that you may hear me use, and some of those terms may be familiar to some. Uh, are there any physician, how, physicians in the room? So for, for the physicians, they may be familiar with these terms, but for some of you, they may not. BMSCs is bone marrow-derived mesenchymal stem cells. So those are a particular type of stem cell that reside in your bone marrow. ASCs are adipose-derived mesenchymal stem cells. Stromovascular fraction. That's where we take fat and we digest it to break, to basically get rid of the fat cells and to get rid of the collagen that holds everything together. And what we're left with is basically the stem cells and a bunch of building blocks, which we'll talk about. And uh, we're not going to be talking about induced pluripotential stem cells today. All right, history of stem cells. We've known about stem cells since 1908. There was a hematology course in Berlin where they recognized that there was these cells in the blood that had the ability to self-renew, meaning that they could replace themselves. And they also had the ability to differentiate or change into something else. And that was the term stem cells came from that. Um, and in 1964 was the first time that uh, they recognized that, hey, there's stem cells in the bone marrow and they're, they're actually pretty plentiful. And within just four years, they had started already using bone marrow stem cell therapies for conditions. SCID is a, an auto, is a immune deficiency, an autoimmune deficiency. Um, 1991 is when the term mesenchymal stem cells was coined by Arnold Kaplan, and it talked about these cells living not just in the bone marrow, but living everywhere where you have blood vessels. They live right attached to the blood vessels. They have the ability to self-renew, meaning that if you use up 10 million stem cells today, your body will replace them by making copies of the stem cells that are in storage. Plastic adherency is just a way that we help to determine whether they're stem cells or not based on things that we do in the laboratory. And they had the multi-potential differentiation capability, meaning that they can form lots of different things. They can form kidney cells, heart cells, lung cells, liver cells, bone cells, muscle cells. And um, in 2001, they recognized that adipose tissue was a great source of mesenchymal stem cells. There was a researcher at UCLA, and he had read an article in Nature magazine where they had discovered that there were stem cells in the muscle. And the stem cells in the muscle were fairly limited. There's just not a lot of them. But he thought, hey, if there's stem cells in the muscle, maybe there's stem cells in other places too. And he was, a, he was a plastic surgeon, cosmetic surgeon like myself, and he's doing liposuction. And sometimes when you do liposuction, your mind tends to wander a little bit. It's not the most technically challenging skill. And as he's doing liposuction, he says, maybe there's stem cells in the fat. That's the largest, the skin and the fat is the largest tissue or organ in the body. So he sent it off to the lab, and lo and behold, there was about 100,000 times more stem cells per concentrated area of fat as compared to bone marrow. So now there was this incredible potential source of stem cells using fat. However, in 2001, there was a ban on stem cell research in the United States. So they really couldn't do much with the stem cells at that point. So they developed a device at UCLA that would separate the stem cells from the fat, and they shipped it off to Japan. 
And the Japanese doctors who got these machines were plastic surgeons, Dr. Yoshimura. And he would suck out the fat, put it in the machine, out would come stem cells, and he had kind of scratch his head and go, well, what are we going to do with these stem cells? Well, he's not a cardiologist. He's not an orthopedic surgeon. He wanted to use it for his own patients. So he started using it for wounds that wouldn't heal. He started using it for tissue damage, radiation tissue damage, associated with breast cancer, things like that. And, um, uh, and was discovered a lot of neat things that he could do with these stem cells, not just to regrow skin and tissue, but the stem cells tended to have systemic effects all over the body. One of the patients they treated was a patient with rheumatoid arthritis, and the patient was being treated for breast reconstruction using these stem cells after cancer, and the rheumatoid arthritis went into remission. So that was uh, one of those first clues to say, hey, maybe these stem cells are doing something more than just simply growing skin or growing tissue or whatever. Um, now, I didn't realize there was going to be children here at this. I'm sorry if some of these are a little bit racy for parents, but uh, there's, there's a few pictures here that may... Uh, these are the last of those <laughs> pictures. But um, So how did I get first started in this? Well, in 2009, I was the first U.S. doctor to start using these stem cell therapies for the purpose of doing tissue reconstruction, for soft tissue reconstruction. I trained with Dr. Yoshimura in Japan, and we simply wanted a better way of being able to take fat from one area of the body and move it into the other. Because normally when you do that, most of the fat doesn't survive anyway. But when you concentrate it with stem cells it tends to regrow a blood supply, it tends to help those fat cells to be able to survive. So we started using it again to regrow skin and tissue, and we started to notice some of the same things. We had patients that said, hey, my thyroid condition has improved. Patients with Addison's disease, where their adrenal glands were no longer working, all of a sudden their adrenal glands started working again. Um, so we started to see all the, and my knees don't hurt anymore, doc, my memory and concentration is better. Um, I don't have to get up in the middle of the night and go to the bathroom as much because my prostate has shrunk. So that's when we started to look at what are the potential options of using these stem cells in a variety of different circumstances. However, the weird thing was, at that point, there was no rules. With the, the FDA really didn't have guidelines in regards to how can we do these studies to be able to show that stem cells are effective. Are they a drug? I mean, when they leave your body, do they become a drug? That's actually the way the FDA looks at them right now, is that your stem cells are a drug. When they leave your body, they become a pharmaceutical agent, and I have to go through all the same testing I would do for any pharmaceutical agent. But at the time, we wanted to just do a phase one trial to say what can we use these for and where are we starting to see some, some uh, areas where we're seeing some help. And as part of that phase one trial, we've treated over 3,000 patients with no bad outcomes, no, no complications whatsoever. Um, and the majority of those had been in, in issues such as DJD or degenerative joint disease or arthritis, um, MS, Parkinson's, peripheral neuropathy, ischemic spinal injuries, COPD, rheumatoid arthritis, lupus. We did a pilot study, uh, study with Cancer Treatment Centers of America looking at treating the complications of cancer therapy using stem cells to rejuvenate tissue and also a pilot study with University of Arizona, and that was basically just by accident. One of the patients that we treated was the one who had Addison's disease, and her adrenal glands got better from a stem cell treatment for something else. And so, of course, the University of Arizona was excited to say, hey, how did this happen? Let's look at this a little bit more. All right, so stem cells. The old definition of stem cells is basically they have the ability to regrow themselves, so if you use them up, they can replenish themselves, and they also have the ability to differentiate, which has become something else. So in the early days, we started playing with bone marrow stem cells, and there was a lot of excitement. Time Magazine one year listed bone marrow stem cells as the greatest discovery of the, of the decade, and this was uh, back in the 1990s. And we thought, wow, we're going to be able to do all these amazing things with bone marrow stem cells. But when we actually tried using them for regrowing tissue, regrowing cartilage, regrowing bones, things like that, it ended up being a big failure. We weren't really thinking about things correctly. At the time, we were thinking about the cycle of disease as being there's inflammation, and inflammation leads to ischemia, which is poor blood flow to tissue, which leads to apoptosis, which is cells dying. That leads to an immune response as the body goes in to try to clean up these dead cells. That leads to breakdown of tissue or even organs not working the way that they're supposed to, which leads to inflammation. It's just a chronic cycle of disease. And what we thought about stem cells is simply being a step where we could replace damaged tissue or differentiation. So that's all we thought stem cells would do, is if we put them in an area where there's damaged 
tissue, they would change to become that damaged tissue. And when a stem cell becomes a nerve cell or becomes a muscle cell or becomes a brain cell, it's kind of stuck doing that job for the rest of its life. But if we haven't addressed all the other issues that cause those cells to break down and die in the first place, we're really not re uh, doing a good job of replacing the problem. So if you look at a picture like this, you've got um, on the left, you've got an MRI, and then you've got a drawing on the right, and it shows what you're basically seeing on this MRI, which is bone deterioration, cartilage breakdown. This person has some swelling in their joint, that's a joint fluid, and their meniscus is actually missing in this, uh, in this MRI because they had it surgically removed because it was damaged. So if we took one of those little cartilage cells from one of these areas, can they see my mouse up there? Good, because I can't see it. <laughs> if you take one of those cartilage cells that are damaged and you throw it in a petri dish and you throw in a couple bone marrow cells, the bone marrow stem cells will change to become brand new healthy cartilage cells, okay? But when I harvest bone marrow, when we harvest bone marrow stem cells, we typically get about 10,000 stem cells from a bone marrow harvesting. 10,000 may sound like a lot to you, but that's nothing compared to the amount of cells needed even to cover a small little pothole in your cartilage. That would take hundreds of thousands of cells. But remember, stem cells have the ability to change and become something else, but they also have the ability to replicate themselves. So if we take 10,000 stem cells, throw it in a Petri dish, overnight they'll become 20,000. 24 hours later they'll become 40,000, 80,000, 160,000. So we kept growing and growing these stem cells in a Petri dish, but we ended up having some problems because we were basically making a copy of a copy of a copy of a copy of a copy. And anybody who's tried to do that on a Xerox machine knows that it doesn't end up looking so great at the end. So we started to get these funny looking stem cells. So everybody would high five and go, now we got millions of stem cells, let's go in and grow some cartilage. And when we actually tried it, it just didn't work. The cells died, the cartilage cells died, everything died. So that's one of the reasons why we gave up on using bone marrow stem cells for a lot of these therapies, because we just simply didn't have enough to really be able to make a difference. So if you look at a fat globule, those big yellow balls, those are adipocytes, or fat cells that are full of oil. The little tiny balls, the yellow balls that are attached to some of those fat balls, those are pre-adipocytes. So those are unfilled fat cells, fat cells that don't have oil in them yet. Then those white strands, those spaghetti strands, that's collagen, that's what holds everything together. And then you have blood vessels in there, and then the, the blue balls with a little blue center, those are representing uh, stem cells. Stem cells are nucleated, they have a nucleus, and those are perivascular cells. They live along the blood vessels, and those are stem cells. So if we take that and we process it, we throw in some collagenase to, break in the coll uh, to separate the collagen, and we spin it down, basically what happens is the fat floats off to the top, we can get rid of that, the collagen floats up to the top, we can get rid of that, and what we're left with down at the bottom is what you hear me call stem cells. Now, doctors, we have to explain to them that it's not just stem cells. There are stem cells in there, but there's also building blocks. When we break up those blood vessels, we create building blocks from those blood vessels. So one way to look at it is stem cells are kind of like a master foreman or a master construction guy. And you hire them to come out to your house, but if you don't have bricks, lumber, and mortar, nothing's gonna get done. So you need to have some of the bricks, lumber, and mortar to actually get things done. Anybody here a PRP? Have you guys heard of PRP out there? So PRP is just growth factors. It's basically bricks, lumber, and mortar, but it doesn't have, you don't have the construction form in there to actually organize it to use it correctly. So looking at this slide here, this is just a complicated slide that shows you some of the markers that we use to determine what is a pericyte or a stem cell. What's an, adipo what's an adipocyte? What's a preadipocyte? And here's a, a nice little picture of pericytes, what they look like. So they wrap around the blood vessels, they're constantly sensing what's going on in the bloodstream, and they can, even though they're not in the bloodstream themselves, they can respond to what's going on in the bloodstream by releasing chemical signals, growth factors, proteins, and they can also mobilize, they can move, they can take off and crawl into the blood vessel and go somewhere else. So this is a pericyte here, and it shows what some of the pericytes can turn into. One of the things that we do know now is a preadipocyte, which is unfilled fat cell. If you take an unfilled fat cell and you put it in a stressed environment, it can de-differentiate, which means go backwards and become a stem cell again. So unfilled fat cells are another great source of potential stem cells. And in addition, of course, a pericyte can turn into an actual adipose-derived stem cells. This is just a slide to show you the, the difference between stem cell concentrations from your bone marrow versus your fat. That's why we like to use fat, because we have the same types of stem cells. It's called uh, mesenchymal stem cells, 
but they're in tremendously higher numbers than what you can get from bone marrow. This is a little bit of a discouraging film or uh, slide, but um, let, to put this in perspective, you have about 10 million stem cells floating around in your bloodstream right now, and those 10 million stem cells, you'll utilize many of those you'll utilize today. In some cases, we'll burn through about 22 million stem cells per day, just for everyday wear and tear and repair in our bodies. Now, if you use up 10 million stem cells today, you don't want to deplete your reserves, so what your bone marrow does is it makes a copy of the guys in storage. What we do know now is by the time you're about 60 or 70 years old, virtually every stem cell in your bone marrow has been copied, 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 copied. And that's one of the reasons why aging occurs, is because you have the reserves that you're utilizing, your stem cells in your bone marrow, they have been copied so many times that they're not as effective as they were when you were 15 and 20 years old. Whereas your adipose stem cells, they don't do that. They're your reserve cells. Now, why are they sitting there in your fat doing nothing, and why aren't they doing something to help you out? That's something we don't really understand understand completely, but that's what they're there. Now you can take these adipose stem cells and again, you can differentiate, you can grow all these different tissues to be able to replace tissue. If you look at one of the first models that we used to really understand how stem cells work, they took some fat from a mouse's tummy and they tagged the stem cells so that they would know where these stem cells went to and what they became. And then they placed them in the scalp. And the purpose was is that they knew when they put the fat in there, the fat was going to die because it didn't have a blood supply. And so that then when the stem cells became new fat cells, they could count them and, and measure how effective were stem cells are at becoming new fat cells. But if you think about it, the problem isn't that there's not enough fat. We put more fat than there's blood supply. The problem is there's not enough blood supply. So the stem cells were smarter than the doctors. What the stem cells did is they didn't become new fat cells because that wasn't the problem. What they did is they became new blood vessels. So that, that area in yellow shows you the new capillaries or the new blood vessels that had grown into those areas when the animals were treated with fat plus the stromovascular fraction or stem cells. And the fat survival was 60% versus 30% when they didn't mix it with stem cells. So again, that was one of our first clues that stem cells are smarter at recognizing what needs to happen first before you can heal or repair. If you've got bone on bone deterioration in your joint because of, of damage and there's no cartilage left, if I put a bunch of cartilage cells in there, they're not going to grow. That would be like trying to grow a rose on top of a sidewalk. The bone surface is dead. It's scarred. There's no blood supply. Stem cells are smarter than that. The stem cells go in, they remove the scarred bone, they regrow the blood supply, and then they start growing new cartilage. One of the ways that we really recognized this was when they started treating patients, or when they started treating animals, they would take an animal, they would tie off a blood vessel, cause a little heart attack, and they would inject stem cells into the heart muscle. And the thought process, again, is that the stem cells would become new heart muscle. But what they were amazed to see is that what the stem cells really did is they went in and they sent a signal that was measurable that we understand now to tell the heart muscle cells that weren't getting enough oxygen because the blood supply wasn't there to go into a state of hibernation. Say, look, I'm going to help you guys out here, but you need to go to sleep for a little bit. Then it sent a signal to the other areas where the heart muscle was getting getting enough oxygen to say, look, you need to pick up the pace because this area is going to be sleeping for a little while. Then it, is, then it sent a signal to the blood vessels to cause them to dilate so it would decrease the blood pressure so the heart didn't have to work as hard. It caused the tone around the veins to increase so the blood would return faster so the heart could work more efficiently. And it did all of these jobs before it actually, and then it went to work trying to repair the damaged heart cells instead of replacing them. Because remember, a stem cell doesn't want to become a heart cell because it's stuck doing that job forever and it's kind of boring. It would rather do a lot of different things. So the stem cells went in and they repaired the environment first before they actually went in and replaced the cells that were needed to be damaged. And this is how we're able to measure that with all these different growth factors. So we now know that when you take a stem cell and you release it into an environment and activate it, sometimes activation is just mechanically, meaning you just take it from its area where it's sleeping and move it to a different area. It's kind of like shaking the hornet's nest. So they want to know what's going on. And in those, in those processes, they start to release all of these different growth factors, trophic factors, paracrine response, cytokines, 
They can break down scar tissue. Anti-apoptosis means they halt cells from dying, even if the cells are not getting enough oxygen at the time. Angiogenesis means they grow new blood vessels. Mitogenesis, they repair the damage to the cells from inside. They can repair damaged mitochondria. They can, they can repair the cells the way that the cell responds. It's kind of like they send little, um, they send messenger RNA and they send um, exosomes, which actually are like taking a flash drive and putting it into your computer and rebooting from that flash drive so it can reset the cell and make it work more efficiently. They're incredibly effective at immune response. They're very effective at, at halting abnormal immune response and helping your body to establish a more effective immune response. And some of the really interesting studies that are going on right now at Pasteur Institute in France, they're taking animals that they're infecting them with funguses, viruses, bacteria, and they're treating them not with antivirals, antifungals, um, um, antibiotics, they're treating them just with stem cells. And in fact, there's a study going on right now in Canada where they're taking patients that are in the intensive care unit and they're dying from infection and they're treating them with stem cell therapy because the stem cells themselves aren't just, they're not just incredibly effective at helping the immune system, they're also incredibly effective at directly killing these uh, organisms. So, anti-inflammatory effects, that's one of the really amazing areas. I mean, stem cells are attracted by certain things. If I inject a stem cell into your body and just let it go where it's gonna go, the first place it's gonna go to is any area where there's a lack of oxygen. And the other thing that they're gonna go to is any area where there's inflammation. So if there's any inflammation going on, the stem cells are gonna head to that area. They're gonna block the macrophages, the cleaning cells that get in there and kind of start, you know, when your body creates an inflammatory response, it's important, it's part of the healing. So when your ankle gets all swollen after you get it sprained, that's increasing blood flow to the area, which is delivering stem cells, and that swelling is how your body attracts the cleaning cells, which are gonna go in and clean out that debris and junk. But unfortunately, sometimes that inflammatory cycle, if it can't finish, if the healing process can't finish, it just feeds upon itself, so you get chronic inflammation. The stem cells are very good at blocking that. Stem cells are also very good at the immunomodulatory response. They can inhibit plur proliferation of uh, B cells and T cells and natural killer cells that are tuned into you, meaning they can halt the autoimmune response. They're very good at being able to recognize substances which don't belong and being able to present them to the cells to, to program an immune response through the dendritic cell response. Um, and so they can be used as an immunotherapy. You can take cancer cells and you can desiccate them, break them up, culture them with stem cells, and the stem cells will become trained to tell the body that this cancer cell is no longer something that should be uh, uh, tolerated. Cell-to-cell -cell communication is becoming incredibly more important that we learn that the stem cells are very good at communicating with cells to tell them, look, you're not working correctly. You need to change the way that you're responding. And they can do this through release of messenger RNA that can help to repair DNA. They can, uh, they can do it through uh, microvesicles and what we call the paracrine response. In addition, home to injury. Stem cells are very good at heading into an area, finding out that there's something bad going on, and saying, hey, you gotta come over here. We need some help over here. This is an interesting little video. This is a zebrafish, and that little hole at the top of that zebrafish is an injury or wound that they cause, and then you see the blood vessel that was down there in red, and then that little circle is showing you a stem cell living next to the blood vessel, and you can watch as the stem cell crawls right up there to the area of damage, and then as soon as it does that, you can see all the other stem cells from the bloodstream. They're leaving the blood vessels, and they're crawling right up to that area of injury because that's how the body tells itself, hey, we need more, we, we've gotta recruit more stem cells to come over to this area to help out. And that's what our bodies do too. Now we're not as quick as, as a zebrafish that can regrow its fin in 24 hours, but you know, we're, hopefully we'll get there soon. Angiogenesis, again, they're very, very good at regrowing blood vessels. So if there's an area where there's inadequate blood supply, they will regrow new blood supply and they'll be, they can help program cells that are not getting enough oxygen to be able to tolerate that lack of oxygen, to stop what's called anaerobic metabolism, which, where cells are not getting enough oxygen. Like if your car muffler or your car air intake is blocked and your car works, but it's making all sorts of smelly uh, smells and funny sounds, the stem cells are very good at helping that to, to resolve. 
So differentiation is the ability for a stem cell to change and become something else, and that's important, but it's only a tiny piece of the puzzle because stem cells can also wound remodel, take away scar tissue, grow new blood supply, prevent cells from dying, home to injury is calling other cells to the area, the immune response, the paracrine response, the ability to talk to the cells and tell them they're not working correctly and to help encourage them to operate the way that they're supposed to. That's all the things that stem cells are doing. So now if you look at the cycle of disease, instead of just replacing tissue or degenerative tissue or organs, we can halt every part of the disease process by being able to utilize the stem cells for all these different potential responses. Now this, this is a little bit of a busy slide, but it's basically just showing you that we now know that adipose tissue is actually better at a lot of things than bone marrow tissue. So even if you can get enough bone marrow, like for example, if you got a bunch of healthy donors in their 20s to give bone marrow cells, and you grew them up to five times, you can expand them up to five times without really decreasing their potency, even then the bone marrow or the fat stem cells are, are a little bit better at doing a lot of these little jobs that we talked about. So these are all the areas where there's current clinical research going on or have been done utilizing mesenchymal stem cells for a variety of different circumstances to be able to help with spinal cord injuries, kidney disease, um, all sorts of autoimmune disease, and of course tissue reconstruction because that's where it all started was with tissue reconstruction. So some of the, uh, so this was a study that was published in 2015. They treated 1,800 joints with stem cell therapies. This was a friend of mine in uh, Czech Republic and um, they had fantastic results utilizing adipose stem cells from your own fat, not changing them, not modifying them, not, change, not manipulating them, just basically placing them into the area to help regrow cartilage and regrow tissue. These were patients that had been on a waiting list for, um, for joint replacement. And in, in the Czech Republic, you can be on that waiting list for a long, long time. And uh, they went ahead and treated these patients and 87% and of those patients were able to come off the waiting list for joint replacement, so it's pretty impressive. This is a study where they took patients that had heart failure. And typically, once you get to a point where you have this degree of heart failure, you're just going to go downhill. You're going to get to a point where you need a transplant, which is typically when you get down to an MVO2 of 15. And what they saw is the stem cells were able to stabilize the disease. Now, some, pay, some doctors would look at that and go, well, there wasn't much improvement. It only went from 16.6 to 17. But the key there is it didn't go down, whereas all the control patients, the patients who didn't get real stem cells that just got sugar water, they all went downhill. So translational research. So you guys are used to, you know, you hear about, and patients will ask me all the time, hey, well, why, don't, why aren't you doing this big, huge study with thousands of patients, and you've got one group that just gets sugar water, the other group doesn't, and the doctors don't even know, and, and then you're able to really find out whether stem cells work or not. And that's the way we've always done studies in the past. But those types of studies are incredibly expensive, and they take years. The average cost for a study like that is about $100,000 per, per patient. With that, that doesn't even include the therapy. That's just the cost of uh, performing the study. So translational research is where we understand now, we're a little bit smarter than just saying, hey, you know what, I think if we give people this plant, it, this extract from this plant, their blood pressure will go down because these guys in Africa that are eating this, these plants, they don't send, tend to have high blood pressure. It was all observational. We didn't really understand what things were doing. We basically had to observe the effects. But now we understand at a cellular basis, we understand how stem cells are working at the cellular level and so we can basically say, look, we've got this, we understand what the cells do at a cellular level, let's understand this disease, and if the stem cells match from the standpoint of they have a likelihood of addressing the disease from that standpoint of cellular function, then we should be able to help. And then we design a study where we basically say, let's directly go right to humans and see if this has a, a benefit for them. So this is, for example, this is, a tr this is not a study that was done. This is just a translational model. So this is a group of doctors who studied stem cells, and they said, hey, these stem cells can do a lot of different things. Um, let's look at acute kidney ischemia, or let's look at atherosclerotic kidney artery stenosis, kidney disease. And can stem cells help with kidney disease? And they basically went through, and they matched it up. And they said, yeah, it should help with this stage. It should help with this stage. It should help with this stage. And that's a translational study where you understand how the therapy should respond, and then then all you have to do is measure the clinical response or the cellular level response. So how do adipose stem cell therapies work and why are 
not all stem cell therapy is the same from the standpoint of, you know, when we first started, we were the only center in the United States doing adipose derived cell therapies. Now there's over 600 centers in the United States. But there's been a tremendous advancement in technology since we first started doing this in 2009. In 2009, we were lucky if we got 10 million stem cells per treatment. Now we, we get closer to 100, 200 million stem cells. And now we have things like stem cell paste. So there's some improvements in the way that we look at harvesting and taking stem cells that have really improved our results. So the basic concept is we take out your fat, we process it, and then we get the stem cells, and then we t inject them back in. But Here's what we, we begin to realize. Your fat is the ocean and the stem cells are the fish. So we were basically trying to get stem cells by sticking a bucket in the ocean and hoping we got some fish inside that bucket. That's not a very effective way of catching fish. So why do we care about the fat cells? We shouldn't because the fat cells aren't important. It's the stem cells that live inside the fat cells. So now we use devices that are designed to basically wash the fat so it washes that layer of fat, and then it collects all the washings. So that's one of the reasons why we can get incredibly high concentrations of stem cells. Now, in addition, if you use old-fashioned liposuction, you rip blood vessels, and you cause inflammation, you cause damage. So that if I put stem cells in your bloodstream, where do you think they want to go? They want to go right back to repair the liposuction damage. So we got to decrease the damage we're causing, not only to get better and higher quantity and quality of cells, but also not to distract the stem cells from their intended purpose. So this German device was developed that helps us to be able to do that. And this video is not showing, is that correct? It is showing? It's loading. Well, anyway, this is an interesting video. I wish I could get it to show. But basically what this video shows is you guys are, may have been used to seeing regular liposuction in the past, uh, which rips and tears. This is the fat comes out and there's no damage. So this is looking underneath the skin and that area of fat, that little area where there's an empty pocket, that's where we sucked out the fat, the, the fat with this device because it basically allows us to remove the fat without damaging blood vessels or nerves or connective tissue or anything else. So again, we don't create damage so that we get better quality stem cells and higher concentrations of stem cells. In addition, we now have the ability to use a stem cell paste that was developed in Italy. And basically, the concept behind the stem cell paste, it was, it was invented by a plastic surgeon. And what he was trying to do is he wanted to be able to inject fat into the fine lines and wrinkles into the face. And he couldn't do that with big, plump fat cells because they would clog the needle. So he said, OK, let's create a device that would get rid of the big fat cells and only keep the little tiny fat cells that don't have any oil in them. In addition, you don't want big, plump fat cells going into your face because if you gain weight, you're going to look like the Michelin tire person with big old plump, plump, plump face. So he said, let's take the fat cells that don't like to get oil in them, the ones that are low in beta receptors, and let's put them into the face instead because they're tiny, I can inject them in the needle. So he did it, and the recovery of the patient's skin was amazing. There's their aging, the deterioration, the sun damage, the collagen, everything was so dramatically improved that he said, something's going on here. So he sent it off to University of Miami, and the guys at University of Miami went, oh my gosh, these fat cells that have no oil in them are actually stem cells, and they're sticky and gooey, so it created a way of having a stem cell paste where if I inject stem cells in between your knee joint, you can imagine that space, there's no oxygen really in there. The stem cells float around, they start dying right away because there's no oxygen, but they send a signal to the rest of the body to say, help, help, I need help here. So then the stem cells from your bloodstream can go to that area to help heal the damage. But what if you have a diminished number of stem cells in your bloodstream that aren't really doing the job? Then the therapy is not going to work. And in addition, they don't have the ability to form complex structures because they can't adhere to anything. But with the stem cell paste, the stem cell paste can stick to the surface of the joint. The stem cell paste can survive for up to two years in a low oxygen environment, like in your joint. And because they form a matrix, you can actually regrow complex structures. So now you can regrow cartilage. You can regrow your ACL ligament. You can go regrow your cartilage. So we can do a lot of tremendous things using the stem cell paste. This is basically the concept. If you imagine we've got big, plump fat cells that are full of oil. They're fragile. They're, they're water balloons that are stretched out. And if I put them in a chamber with a ball bearing that, and shake it, the ball bearing, like a martini 
glass with ball bearings in it, the ball bearings as they move are going to break the fat cells that are full of oil and they're going to all get flushed out. And so all I'm going to be left with is stem cells. I'm going to be left with little strands of blood vessels that keep the paravascular cells. And then I'm going to be left with these immature stems, these immature fat cells, which are actually stem cells when you put them under stress. Okay. That's not really important. This is just showing the secretory, uh, what stem cells produce. So when we take stem cells and we digest them to make them liquid stem cells to go in your bloodstream, we lose a lot of the potency. And what these slides are showing is just that the potency of these preadipocytes and the intact capillaries with the intact paravascular cells, it's kind of like they work a little bit better if they're still attached to their house. Yeah, their house is moving around to other places, but when they're still in their neighborhood, even though the neighborhood's been moved, they still tend to work a lot better that way. And that's, that, that's what these slides are showing, is just the doctors may find this interesting, but this is just showing that, yes, they're, they're incredible at their production of all of these important factors, much more so than the liquid. So let's look at that knee that we looked at before. So we saw the damage to the cartilage. Um, there's the person, their meniscus has previously been cut out because it was, it was damaged. There's joint swelling, all of that. This is the same patient 12 weeks later. Not only is the bone surface healed and the cartilage is regrown, but they regrew back their meniscus. So something that was previously surgically cut out has grown back from utilizing the stem cell paste. This is a person with a fracture that had been there for a year and wouldn't heal. This is after a single injection of stem cells. It's about 14 weeks. The fracture, the bone is now completely healed. This is a person who lost the tip of her finger. She cut off the tip of her finger at the nail bed, below the nail bed. And it, the stem cells were able to regrow back her finger. So that's pretty amazing. Kids can do this. Little kids can do this. But you don't do this as an adult. This is a person who has a, 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 a type of disease where she forms ulcers in her body and they do not heal. This ulcer had been there for years. And we don't have long-term follow-up on her. We only saw her at 10 days. But at 10 days, this wound was almost covered. She's now reported that it's completely healed over, just from one single injection of the stem cell paste. It was a granulomatous ulcer disease. Um, this is a patient with, uh, that had some surgery on her ankle, and she developed severe lymphedema. And, um, you know, lymphedema is a tough disease. It, it's really difficult to treat. So we thought, well, you know what? Stem cells are really good at growing lymphatic uh, chains. So if you take lymphatic vessels and you grind them up and you put them in a Petri dish with stem cells, the stem cells will grow all these cool little branches of actual lymphatic chains or lymphatic vessels. So we said, well, maybe it'll do it in the body. So we injected her lymphatic chains with the stem cell paste. And you can see six weeks later, her lymphedema is gone. So that's the kind of cool things we can do with this paste. Now, we have one issue right now in the United States with stem cell therapy, and that's our friends, the FDA. Now, the FDA basically for years said, well, this isn't really, you're not really changing the tissue, you're not modifying it, you're not doing really anything to it, so really it's not within our jurisdiction. So we were able to do our studies basically without the jurisdiction of the FDA, and that was great from that standpoint. Um, but there came a point in 2014 where the FDA said, no, 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 stem cells are a drug, and when they leave your body, they become a drug. Well, here's the problem. Your stem cells are a drug, your stem cells are a drug, your stem cells are a drug, but they're all different drugs. So if I want to do a study, I, I have to do a separate trial on every single person because every person's stem cells are considered a separate drug. So basically what that did is it halted the ability to do any stem cell research in the United States to get to phase two or phase three trials to show that it actually worked. So we continued to do these phase one trials hoping that something would change. Well, thankfully, the Congress and the Senate kind of got a little pissed that we're 15 years behind every other country when it comes to stem cell therapy. So in 2016, they signed, and President Obama signed into law the 21st Century Cures Act. And with the 21st Century Cures Act, they gave the FDA until December 13th of this year to come up with concrete rules that will allow us to use your stem cells to treat you and to do it in such a way that we can prove it works so we can do real good studies, but we can do so without saying that everybody said stem cells are a separate drug. Those rules are starting to come about. There's already a certain designation called an RMAT designation, which allows us to look at rare diseases in which there are no other treatment for, to basically fast track them as a drug therapy. We're still having to do it as a drug therapy, but at least we can fast track it and make it happen a little bit more quickly. But the issue still right now is funding 
because who's going to pay for this? Drug companies will pay for a drug trial because they're going to make millions and billions of dollars off of their drug if it's approved. But if we're able to approve that your stem cells can treat you with all these different diseases, that's not something we can license or patent or be able to put a label on. It's something that's beneficial for mankind, but it's not, it's not going to get to that point. Um, thankfully, we're, they're starting to use the models that are happening in other countries where they're understanding that, hey, there's a cost savings here. FedEx is a company that's already stepped up and said, you know what? We could save a lot of money doing stem cells instead of joint replacements. So they're looking right now at doing a protocol where they say, look, if you want a joint replacement, we'll pay for it, but you're going to pay your $5,000 copay. You want a stem cell therapy? It's free. Because if the stem cell therapy only worked 50% of the time, think of the money that they would save not doing all those joint replacements. So hopefully we're going to get to this point where we see federal funding and we see insurance companies stepping up and saying, hey, this is going to save us a lot of money if we go down this route of supporting these types of trials. Thank you very much. Were we new questions and answers now? Okay, do, does somebody want to walk around with a microphone to... You go first. Sorry. Yeah, oh my God. How, how many uh, periodic paralysis patients have you treated, uh, and, what, and what were the outcomes? And, and, and where, do you, where do you inject these cells? Do you inject them right in the thigh, or do you just put it back in the bloodstream? Or? So in the early days, um, so with the new high-dose protocol with the, the PACE, we've treated only four patients. Um, prior to that, we treated three patients with just the, the IV therapy, and it wasn't really significant, not at all. In fact, the response was, in my opinion, more placebo than anything else. So um, with the stem cell, what we do is we do a high-dose IV therapy. The high-dose IV therapy is typically 100, 200 million cells. And then we also inject the affected muscle groups with the stem cell paste because the stem cell paste is going to act as a magnet to call the stem cells to the area, and they're going to continue to release all these cytokines and trophic factors and everything for up to a two-year period. So it has that continual repair process for up to two-year period, uh, replacing cells, blocking the inflammatory response. Now, do I know what it does? to um, ion channels? No, we don't know what it's affecting, how it affects ion channels. We do know for cardiac muscle, it's very good at affecting ion channels, and that's one of the reasons why stem cell therapies have been so effective at, at helping patients with all sorts of different arrhythmias. Do you have an objective measure of muscle mass or muscle strength? Uh, no, because and... remember, this is a phase one study, so we're really limited, because when it comes to a phase one study, we're allowed to measure, did we kill you or not, basically, and that's really about all we can measure is complications. So there are a lot of different things that we can do in a phase two or a phase three study, but a phase one, we're severely limited by the fact that all we're trying to determine, our, our outcome measure is, what are there any complications? How much does it cost per treatment? Well, that... And is it a one-time treatment, or do you do it multiple times? Thus far, with the high-dose therapy, we've only had to do a one-time treatment, meaning uh, some of the patients are now over a year out. But again, not everybody responded incredibly well. Some of the patients say, hey, I had it a year ago, and I still feel a benefit, but it's not real. I haven't really noticed a tr tremendous difference well, in my motor Well, you had four. You had four patients, right? So, yeah. I mean, you could just say, what are the four patients' outcomes? The two of the patients that were really severe did incredibly well, and they're still saying that they see a benefit from the therapy. The two patients that were early stages have said, well, I, I see some benefits overall in my life, because remember, the stem cells work in every area of your body, but as far as their disease itself, they don't really see that much significant and just less, change. So the cost? The cost can be anywhere from 15000 to 20000 and okay. that's the cost at the study cost. So the treatments that they're doing, the, what we're doing is not unique from the standpoint of you can get this in Germany, you can get it in Italy, you can get it in Japan, you can get it in China. Those places typically they're charging about seventy to hundred thousand dollars for the same treatments. Wow, well, that's where Strongbridge comes in, right? Okay. So I, I share your frustration with some of the challenges of the FDA. Mm -hmm. At the same time, the FDA is trying to protect patients from trials being done that are not done well and, and where appropriate control populations are studied and so forth. So, so one question I have is, have you done any controls? And second of all, 
have you we, done? We can't because the, the rules. So here's my frustration isn't with the FDA in that regard. My, so unfortunately what happened is we started to see success in what we were doing. And we were approaching everything from the standpoint of trying to do studies to look at is this safe? Is this something that we can move on to phase two and phase three trials? Now there are hundreds of clinics opening up all over. Just in the city of Scottsdale, Arizona, there are 20 stem cell clinics out of the 600 world or nationwide because of the fact that we've seen such great success in patients and the stories are out there and patients are saying, hey, I want this. The problem we had with the FDA is there were no guidelines to allow us to go on to a phase two trial where we could really do a good study to demonstrate clinical outcomes. There was no possibility of doing that. You couldn't design the study because there was no way of making that happen because the FDA had no rules. They basically just said, if you want to do a study, it has to be a drug study. But you, everybody's stem cells are a different drug, so you're going to have to do a separate study on every single individual. So cool. now we're hopefully by December 13th of this year, we'll have those guidelines and we'll be able to move on to phase two and phase three studies. We've chosen a couple diseases uh, where we're looking at an RMAT designation where we want to fast track approval because if we can get a fast track approval on something, then we can go to the FDA and go, wow, the reason this worked was because of all of these different things. And guess what? That fits this disease, this disease, this disease. So hopefully that will allow us to get expanded consideration under practice of medicine, meaning that we understand how something works and as doctors we're allowed to do it under practice of medicine. It also seems misguided to me to even think about doing the periodic paralyses because the cells, the stem cells from patients will still have the dominant gain of function mutation that the patients are suffering from. So if they regenerate new muscle cells from their stem cells, even if that happens, and you haven't shown us any data to suggest that it has, the, the problem is that they're going to be the same muscle cells that have the disease and the patient to start with. So, you know, with the new CRISPR-Cas9 technologies, one of the things we're thinking about at UCSF is taking stem cells from patients and genetically manipulating them to fix the mutation and then to put them back in so they can grow healthy, normal muscle cells without the gain of function mutation that's going to continue to propagate the same disease problems that the patients are suffering from in the first place. Yeah, absolutely. That's the way to go. But you remember, it's not just differentiation. So the stem cells have all these other affecting, so being able to rid the vacuoles that form, being able to decrease the inflammatory response, the, the subsequent over the years as you develop more and more tissue trauma and damage, if you grow new muscle cells, even though those cells are carrying the same genetic predisposition, they're still going to be healthy cells at that time mm -hmm. when they're regrown. Does that make sense? So that otherwise, so here's the way I would put that question to you. Why did the patients get better? Yeah. Well, with the, I don't think you've shown us that they did. Uh, you know, the periodic paralysis, the natural history of the disease is that patients often improve spontaneously as they get older. Not always, but in, in, in many cases. So if, if you show us an N of four and only two got better, it could be that they were destined to get better anyway. It could have been a placebo effect. It could have been from, you're right. You're absolutely from, right. from the attention that they got and, and better medical care since they were involved in a, in a procedure in a medical clinic. And, and so the, the problem is, you know, if, you, if I give a placebo to you know, a bunch of people, some of them are going to get better and, True. and they're it, it, for lots of different reasons. And, and if they get better, you can't argue with that. But, 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 I, but and I think that that goes to the point doing, of translational research again. But, but I've been doing translational research for 25 years to do, to, to, to say that, you know, we should be doing this in lots and lots of people and getting people in and having them subjected to expensive procedures. You know, that, I'm all for it if, if there's a process where we can test whether this is really efficacious, it's not placebo effect. Um, so, so there, one has to go through the proper channels to do it properly. I, I'm, I'm also, you know, I'd love to learn more about this. I wonder if you've published on the topic at all. Yeah, a couple different publications, not on this, of course, because this was just a small group, but on a lot of different other areas. So, you have to look at if you look at the advancement in stem cell technology, it hasn't happened at the large research centers. Unfortunately, it hasn't because the funding isn't there. 
U, UCSF and other places like that, they usually don't do studies unless there's, there's some funding behind it. And if there's not funding behind it, those studies don't happen. A lot of these studies are occurring at the level of the clinician out there trying these treatments. So these treatments that we're talking about right now are approved in 30 other countries around the world. I mean, the ability to reverse heart disease, the re ability to reverse, reverse uh, cartilage. You have to understand that when they first published those studies on cartilage, most of the orthopedic surgeons said, well, the MRI didn't change, so it's all placebo effect. But we now know that the MRI didn't change dramatically because you improved the blood supply, you broke down scar tissue, you decreased the inflammatory response. So the patients really were better but we didn't understand enough about the disease to really be able to, or we didn't understand enough about how the cells were working to be able to truly say, yes, we're making a, a, a change here. So as time has gone on, the stem cells have become, they, they are validating themselves in a lot of different areas based on the fact that we're seeing a lot of these outcomes and there's no other way to explain it. It's not just placebo effect. I agree, on an N of four, you can't really make any determination. You just can't. But that's the same argument that was made in a lot of other areas like heart disease, like oste uh, osteoarthritis, which we now know, yeah, it actually does work. Go ahead. I have a question about uh, cardi uh, About what, I'm sorry? Cardiomyopathy? Yeah. Do you talk about uh, that's in the DNA or by eating bad or uh, provoked? by other diseases. Yeah, so the interesting thing is the studies that have been done on cardiomyopathy, non-ischemic cardiomyopathy, patients had tremendous benefit and improvement, and those are all published, the PRECISE trial and the NYSA. There's a lot of published studies, but why did it help if it was just, if it was non-ischemic disease? I have uh, the PLN mutation. This is the most aggressive form of cardiomyopathy, and uh, my heart muscle change in um, connective tissue, and it's already started, but I wonder, the 70% is that from the 100% working heart muscle to 70%, because when it's 70%, you don't live anymore. I'm not sure I understand the question. Um, well, most time people uh, die with uh, the PLN mutation when their uh, heart muscle is very bad, so why? <coughs> I don't know that stem cell therapy has been used specifically for that. Oh, okay. Yeah, so I don't know about that. I'm talking about ischemic and non-ischemic cardiomyopathy, just in general. Okay. okay. Thank you. Yeah. Wow, a lot of questions. We're we're coming. We're coming. Saw the red flag. <laughs> there you go. Thank you so much. I I um. I am a physician who has been diagnosed with HPP, and um, back in 2014, I uh, was requiring oxygen and wheelchair, and um, I uh, opted to go abroad and have stem cell treatment. I didn't do the autologous because it didn't make sense to me, like Dr. Bell was saying, the genetic aspect of my disorder. So. Um, um, after one treatment, I was off oxygen and um, not falling daily. And um, I do have five other autoimmune disorders, none of which affected my breathing or my walking, but um, I've subsequently had three other treatments, and we now ha are offering it to our patients because of the tremendous response that I saw personally in my body. Yeah. And I do agree we need the research for it and we certainly need guidelines for it, but um, you know, other countries are doing it and I, we're thrilled to offer it to our little community in Orange County, so. Yeah, so here, and that goes, so one of the things that I have to get by physicians is physicians always get stuck on differentiation, differentiation, that's what's happening. And especially when we're talking about genetic abnormalities, they say, well, wh wait a minute, we're growing cells that carry the same genetic predisposition. But it's not just that, it's the repair that's occurring, the improved cellular communication, the blocking of the inflammatory response, so it's all those, and the autoimmune reaction. So all of those different, the cycle of disease, if you look at functional medicine, you're not looking at one particular problem, it's a cascade event. And you may not be, be able to fix the genetic abnormality, but what you can fix is all the other cascade events that help to create the clinical uh, outcomes that you see. Now you guys are using autologous cells in Orange County though, yeah. Well, it's illegal, right? Yeah. 
Yeah, now the, here's, the good, here's the good news about autologous cells, though. So some of the studies where they've looked at using autologous cells versus using somebody else's stem cells, if I give you somebody else's stem cells, you're not going to reject them. But that ability to have that cell-to-cell -cell communication and to measure and sense the environment is better with your own cells versus somebody else's. The best way to explain it is it's kind of like your, your body has its own operating system or language, and your own stem cells speak a little bit more effectively. Yeah, other people's stem cells can do a lot of those same jobs, but if you look at the overall paracrine response, if you look at the ability to produce all these uh, fantastic cytokines and trophic factors, it does better when you use your own stem cells versus somebody else's. Thanks. So I have millions of stem cells in my fat and cruising around my body. No, Are, they're just kind of just sitting there. Okay, so they're in my body. Are they... Okay, so they're sitting there, so like they're lost, are they stupid? Like why do they have to be taken out of my body and put back into my body we don't before know. they'll go and repair we don't know. my heart? They did some studies at University of Utah where they looked at heart disease factors, risk factors for heart disease. And they looked at certain groups of patients who were smoking, they were drinking, they were eating Big Macs every day, they weren't exercising. They did everything wrong, but their cardiac risk profile was incredibly low as far as looking at actual um, uh, objective measures like heart scans and, and vessel reactivity, all that type of stuff. Um, and what they found, they were trying to look for, well, maybe there's a gene in these people that help prevent them from getting heart disease even though they're doing everything wrong. They didn't find a gene. But what they did find is that the number of circulating stem cells in their bloodstream were about 100 times that of the normal population. So some of us do mobilize those stem cells. And why is it that some of us do and some of us don't? I don't know. But all we're doing is creating an equalizing factor. Instead of you having 10 million stem cells in your bloodstream, we're going to dump 100 million. And they're going to be fresh stem cells, not the ones that are in your bone marrow that are copies of copies of copies of copies. So when, when a person... Um, gains fat, do they develop new stem cells? They, get, they develop new fat cells. Okay. We used to think you only had so many fat cells, but we now know that your fat cells are turning over. Okay, let me give you a perspective that's gonna blow your mind, okay? All right, ready? <laughs> if I shut off every stem cell in your body right now, most of your major organs would begin to fail within 90 days. That's how important they are for everyday wear and tear and repair. They're absolutely essential for keeping us alive, okay? So it's really just about being able to boost those numbers with those guys that are in storage doing nothing right now. Again, we don't know why they're in storage. We don't know why they're doing nothing. But they do respond to things like infections, subcutaneous infections, wounds, incisions. They, they even respond to local areas. If you sample stem cells, adipose stem cells from a knee in somebody with chronic arthritis, and you take that same fat from the other side, you're going to get higher quality stem cells, meaning that their growth in, in culture is going to be better than the ones over here where the arthritis was. So the guys over here are contributing somewhat or some way they're being, they're being uh, affected by that disease process in that knee. Uh, when, when a woman is pregnant, uh, many uh, stem cells from the fetus uh, get into the circulation and start growing in various places in the woman. And I'm wondering whether there are, whether we have data about the, uh, whether people have had remissions following a pregnancy, uh, improvements, uh, particularly one could look at whether the child had had uh, periodic paralysis or not. And I just wonder whether we have a natural experiment here. And I don't know if it's related to the fact that women seem to suffer less from periodic paralysis than men and just wonder whether there's some data that we could tap into here. 